Welcome to the third and second to last episode on climate change in Nepal. No worries, my webisodes, our podcast, are not going to end, and keep following me for further confessions of a science holic. Before I begin, I'd like to say something to the community around us. Lately, there's been debates where I wonder why we're still debating about certain topics vaccines, flat world, or flat earth, and so on. Uh, but sadly, we have to reply to those who seek to spread false information, which in turn can cause harm. Uh, like DeGrasse Tyson said, you know, you're free to believe what you want, but at the same time, we must also be aware of what we're saying and who is saying it. Media and people alike react to the debates Person one destroyed person two. Oh, he got schooled with science. Such things. I hope we move away from this and seek to educate and teach and share information. So if you are ignorant of facts or want to spread false ideas or theories or false facts, then you can come at me. I will not destroy you like as other people will say. And I don't know if I'll even put up a fight like other people do, but I'll do something that is far worse. If you come at me with false information, I will educate you. And trust me, I'm sure you do not like being in school. I remember a lot of kids don't want to go to school, so I will educate you if you come at me with false information. With that said, let's get back on the topic. Today we'll continue our journey looking into water resources in rural Nepal and continue into segment which I like to call energy hungry Nepal. Don't worry, at the rate the world is going, we're all hungry for more energy. Our appetite for energy is going up. Trust me, I live in New York City, and here we know what being hungry for energy looks like. But let's talk about water. What is happening outside of Kathmandu? Within the last three years, villages in Western Nepal have been experiencing shortages it's primarily due to change in the weather pattern, a lack of rainfall. They're simply, they're not receiving enough rain as they used to. Uh, still in many rural areas, families are spending multiple hours a day transporting water just for drinking and cooking. Villages like Samjong, located in the upper Mustang, are being abandoned due to lack of rain. Their ability to grow crops and drink water from the rainwater has just been depleted just purely because the rainfall isn't in sufficient enough. People are moving towards water conservation. Uh, people are actively building reservoirs. And we must also think about sustainability. However, we need to ha have hard data on how much water is being used and how much water is getting recharged. Simply using five gallons a day when the recharge rate is only two gallons per day in a 10 gallon tank is not sustainable. We will run out of water on the third day, if this was the case. So what can be done? Well, I can't give you all the solutions. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to, to tell you what about what is happening. Just tell you about what you probably just see outside your window. We will go over some ideas and solutions of what can be done. And I'm sure as we're recording this, there are people who are already actively doing something about it. And there are other people who are coming up with new ideas that, can, that will be very helpful. So now let's take a look at energy hungry Nepal. As I was writing this episode, I bumped into an article on Kathmandu Post on yesterday, January 30th, 2016. It's titled, Government to Declare Energy Emergency. My first reaction when I read this was, really? Now? I mean, isn't it kind of late? And think about it, if there's a storm coming your way, you'd want your government to tell you or declare a weather emergency before the storm gets to you. You know, it doesn't really help declaring a weather or a storm emergency when the storm's already on top of you. But 
it's okay if the government did everything then what are we as citizens of our country going to do we must do something for our own country as well so let's take a look at what is causing this hunger first just general word development development is good but development without destination and development without or rather just development for the sake of development is very dangerous we must understand the technology that we're using we must understand the consequences of using them second gadgets cell phones ipads tvs hair dryers electric razors electric toothbrushes and the list goes on i'm not saying stop using them i for one use many of the things i've just listed is integral part of our modern life however small choices we make when we use them and consume the energy to use them makes a big difference imagine turning your tv on you start watching it and you pause it to go do something and you spend about half an hour doing something whatever you're doing making tea maybe your friend called and you're chatting and your tv is on for half an hour just paused while you spend your time doing something else now let's look at what this really means in numbers right so let's say you do this four times a week let's say you you pause your tv for 30 minutes four times a week and let's say on average my tv uses 200 watts right now let's take that number multiplied by 0.5 hour or 30 minutes uh multiply that by 4 days a week then 4 weeks a month and about 12 months a year we end up with about 19.2 kilowatt hour that is wasted in one year now what does 19.2 kilowatt hour really mean you know like what what are we really wasting because you don't see it so let's put that in perspective you need about 0.7 kilowatt hour of energy to boil 1 liter of water now since nepal is having fuel shortage imagine you're running your gas stove to boil 27 liters of water and just letting it cool for no reason just every year you're going to boil 27 gallons of water and just let it cool i mean yes we do boil our water to drink you know to make sure the bacteria are clean but imagine you didn't have to boil the water this is clean purified water and you're just running your stove to boil 27 liters and just letting it cool for no particular reason I know a lot of the times we don't think about this. The only time we ever go about thinking about this is when we open our wallet and think about okay, how much am I paying to buy that cylinder of gas? But I think it is beyond time we think about beyond our wallet and the consequences that we are paying from our environment. Third, using cars and transportations and motorbikes. They are very convenient, but at the same time, what are we sacrificing for that convenience? The polluted air the oil that we have to buy and rely on from foreign countries we must think about if we have to go about as far as a mile maybe spend that time walking you know you don't have to pay for your gym membership spend that time walking you'll get enough exercise and a mile isn't that very far you can walk a mile in less than half an hour or if you have less time you can always ride a bicycle and these aren't things that nobody can you know it you don't have to have special abilities or lots of money to do it's just a matter of walking or riding a bicycle to get to where you're going in order to reduce the amount of fuel that we're using um i wish our public transportation was better however even using public transportation is far better than driving a car just for one or two people so what do we do regarding this energy issue Let's think about what where our energy is really coming from. Uh fossil fuel, gas tank, the electricity that we generate at a power plant. So, then let's think about what we can re- whether we can really afford the different types of energy. Here in the US, we have multiple sources of fuel uh that we use to generate electricity. Uh we have coal, oil, solar, wind, nuclear. In Nepal we have hydro bunch of hydro plants and all our cars run on oil and we cook our meals using gas tanks our gas cylinders that we purchase so let's think about where are we getting this energy from you know where are we buying these products that we're using to generate this electricity for our everyday use and whether we or whether Nepal as a country has the capability to sustain using these energies. So I don't think we have yet struck oil in Nepal and I don't think that's 
going to really happen. We might find something, but I doubt it's enough to run our country. So I'm pretty sure the gas we cook our food in, those red cylinders that we have in our kitchen, the ones we use to heat water for shower in some places, I'm sure we're importing those. As a country, we don't have the capacity to even generate enough gas to fill those cylinders, to have enough supply for everybody in the country. So what sources of energy do we really have that we can use? Like I said before, there's hydro, which is the popular term and there's the most well-used term when we want to say electricity. Uh, I know we get a lot of power cuts, but it's still from hydroelectricity that is being produced. So other than oil and coal, which we don't have, there is two other energy sources that we can use. We have abundance of wind power and solar energy. Yet, we have not implemented those fully to power our nation. Let's think about where it has been applied to. There has been small projects where wind energy is being applied, uh, there are smaller solar energies, and I know in Kathmandu, on top of the buildings, there are solar energies being used to heat water, yet they have not been used to generate electricity. It is yet still hard to convince people on changing to solar energy on their rooftops to generate electricity with. But if Nepal is to develop themselves as a nation, and as people's hunger for energy increases we do really seriously need to look at expanding our alternative energy sources, not only from hydro to solar and wind. And using those three combinations, I think we can generate enough to sustain our country. Forget about selling extra energy to another country or you know, generating so much that we can supply it to whole of South Asia. Let's just first work on supplying it to every single corner of our own country. Let's supply it to every single citizen in Nepal. Let's think about utilizing more wind energy, which the wind is stronger in higher altitudes. Solar farming in higher ele elevations where the soil isn't as fertile. Not only, hmm, how can I say this? I think eventually we do need to build a solar farm in Nepal. We don't have the capa capacity yet. Eventually we will. And I think that's something we can look forward to because solar farming is quite expensive. But if you want to say, you know, what is a solar farm? I've never seen a solar farm. It's kind of like a humongous rice field. Instead of growing rice, we just have large amount of solar panels spread across the field to generate electricity. If you want to look at some examples, you can Google uh, Solar Star. It's a large site in the U.S. I think there's one in India. I think it's pronounced Charanka Solar Park. Uh, forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong. And if you want to find out what's happening in the future... Japan's building a solar farm. Uh, there's a Kyocera Corporation. They are building a floating solar farm and they're hoping to finish this by 2018. And with this, they're hoping to supply enough energy to 5,000 homes. They're scheduled to finish this by 2018 and will generate about 16,000 megawatt hour per year. And it'll power about 5,000 homes every year. I know it's exciting with a title like floating solar farm. I was thinking some, you know, solar farm energy producing gizmo that's floating up in the air. But this actually farm is actually floating on water, which is actually ex exciting in itself. So if just hearing about it doesn't excite you, check out the pictures of some of these solar farms. Just the array, the way these solar panels, uh, the photovoltaic cells are lined up is an art in itself. There's science behind why they're lined up that way, but you can also appreciate it in a, from an artistic point of view. So we must persuade our government as citizens to convert using alternative energy from the traditional fossil fuels, and at the same time construct sustainable energy production plants based on our country and our location. We as global citizens should demand a safer and cleaner energy source. After all, when we're done living on Earth, it is our kids and grandkids who will inherit it from this world. So what can we as individuals do to help our country move forward and help ourselves live in a better world? Well, I'll just wait for my next episode and we will go over some paths we can take to make this world slightly better. With that, I will leave you with one of my favorite saying. 
I'm not sure where it really comes from. It could be a Native American saying, but it's very short and it goes something like, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you for joining me on the Confessions of Science Holic. Hope you like this show. Please leave me constructive comments. I would I really do like would like to hear from you guys. If you guys are doing something exciting, please let me know. I would definitely like to mention all the exciting things that are happening around the world and in Nepal as well. How the young minds are changing the minds of the previous generation, how the young minds are coming up with new ways to do things that are more sustainable and to leave a better world just for the future generation. And thank you and hope you subscribe to Confessions of Science Holic and don't forget to subscribe to Cookery Productions. They're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. And I'm on Twitter. You can look me up at N I R A U L A S U J A N. My name Mr. Science Holic. Thank you.